Hello, and thank you for your interest in this video from SMI Advisor. My name is Amy Brinkley, and I am the Recovery Support Systems Coordinator for the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. I am also a certified peer support professional in the state of Indiana, and I am joined here with my wonderful colleague, Heather Rodriguez. Heather, would you mind telling folks a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. Um, thanks for having me first and foremost for this conversation, Amy. Um, so my name is Heather Rodriguez. I am a person in sustained recovery. I have a master's in social work. I'm a certified addiction peer recovery coach level two, a certified alcohol and drug addiction consultant level two um, here in Indiana. And then I'm the vice president of recovery and advocacy programs with Mental Health America of Indiana. I'm the director of the Indiana Recovery Network and interim director of Indiana Addictions Issues Coalition. And one of my great heroes, Heather, you're just doing so much amazing stuff. I'm so happy that you're here with us. So in our video today, we plan to discuss how peer support specialists utilize a person-centered approach to support all pathways to recovery. So Heather, we're going to kick off our conversation today with a question and I'll go ahead and, and kick that question off to you. So Heather, what advice would you give to a peer specialist on how to utilize a person-centered approach to support all pathways to recovery? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think first and foremost, um, not only just for new peers, but peers that are moving along in their professional development, really learning about the different uh, pathways of recovery and what that really means. I think certainly in the training, you know, it is a topic that is discussed and I feel like people have a good kind of takeaway post-training like, oh, I get that, like, but really there's a lot more to it. So really educating ourselves on what the pathways are and there are so many out there um, so that we can better inform the individuals that we are providing services to on what types are available and then knowing who provides support for those specific pathways in your communities, right? And so we can tell people about different pathways and if they wanna try that pathway, do we know who to connect them to? So that's important as well, right? Could be in person, might have to be virtual. Uh, it just depends on what that person is looking for. So educating ourselves on the different pathways and then allowing our participants or recoveries to make an informed decision on what type of pathway they would like to try for themselves and then letting them know you know it might take a couple of attempts of different types of pathways or a combination of multiple pathways to find something that's going to really support you and help you sustain your recovery um, and i'll just use a little bit of my own experience so when i was very early getting into recovery this was 18 years ago. I have 16 years of sustained recovery, but so let's say, and not to sound like an old timer, but 18 years ago here in our state, there was really only one pathway that was pretty well known and promoted. Um, and I tried that and it didn't work for me. So I had to really think outside the box and figure out other pathways that I would learn through um, the recovery coach training that those were actual pathways. I didn't even know that, right? And so it takes a while to figure it out. And so allow that person to make an informed choice and for their recovery to be self-directed. That's super important. And then knowing that people come from different backgrounds and walks of life and different experiences. So having a cultural lens when providing peer services, um, and that is not to say culture by way of race or ethnicity, because culture can be your geographic location, your faith, your socioeconomic status, all of those things play a role in our culture, in our character, our, our value system, all that. So just have some wherewithal and again, education about what that means and how to support people who are from different walks of life, but are seeking support to sustain their recovery. That is just so good, Heather. There's just so many nuggets in there. I don't even know where to start. So, you know, I, I you made me think back to my early days in recovery because I, too, am from Indiana and got into recovery about 14 years ago. And you're you're right. Like there was only really one pathway. Um, you know, I, I had been to treatment before. 
Um, and I actually got into sustained recovery through uh, a prison sentence. And so the pathway that I landed on while I was incarcerated was a 12 step model. And that pathway was very much focused on, you know, it, it was it was in, it was instilled into me that this is the only way and you have to, you know, you have to do this or you're never going to make it. And so when I remember when I first got trained as a certified peer in the state of Indiana, I remember just being amazed at this idea and concept that there are all these other pathways. And what do you mean somebody can actually come alongside me and support my recovery outside of that other pathway and I don't have to go to jail or prison or anything else and, and pay all this money to get that? And so when I think about how far we've come in the last 14 years, it is incredible. It is incredible. And so I just, you're just spot on with, with everything that you said. Um, so, so another question, I, I want to kind of pivot a, a little bit. So would, do you have, like thinking back to your early days uh, of being a peer, getting newly certified, um, do you have any advice for how peers can balance sharing their own story of their recovery while supporting others and sharing about and self-directing their own paths? So if you were to go back in time and, and when Heather first got into recovery, how would you how would you advise Heather on sharing and balancing that sharing in a way that honors the, the personal choice that the person you are has? Yeah, so I think one thing we should always ask ourselves is why are we sharing this, right? Is the reason why we are sharing little bits about our personal journey to benefit the person we're supporting? Is it to comfort them, let them know, you know, hey, you're not the only person that has experienced something like that. Let me tell you a little bit about something I went through in the hopes that it will help them grow. So I would always uh, suggest like, what is the why in the sharing? And if it's not really something to benefit the recovery or participant, then you probably shouldn't share it, right? And so being cognizant of that, not oversharing just for the sake of telling your own story um, and really trying to, I think, steer clear from what we call sharing the war stories because we've all been through heck and back in our previous life is what we say, right? Um, and we're in recovery. So we wanna share the positive things about the journey and the process of becoming uh, into recovery and not all the negative stuff. So just you know, be thoughtful in the why you are sharing, how is what you're sharing going to benefit that person? And is there a takeaway for that person? And ensuring it's not just to make yourself feel better or heard, because our job is to hear the other person first and foremost. Right. I think what I'm hearing here is, is we want to empower through our shared experiences. We never want to leave someone um, worse than we found them. And then maybe tailoring our sharing to make sure that we're only sharing what we need to share in a way that's beneficial for the person that's hearing hearing us. And, and because you're right, I've, I've seen too many stories or I've seen too many times where somebody's sharing just for the sake of sharing. And sometimes people, let's be honest, like to hear themselves talk. So you hear a lot about, I've sat in, and this isn't just specific to peers. This mm -hmm. is any any group I, I've been in counselor meetings with people as an advocate as a peer and listen to the counselor talk more about themselves than the person that they were talking to so that's that's not unique to the peer space but I think going back to to some of the things that you said Heather I was thinking about we want to try to refrain from giving advice like that's one thing that I always try not to do the only time you will ever likely hear me giving advice unless it's in a supervisor role in a professional capacity, like overseeing peers, you know, you have to give advice, like that's part of supervision. But in terms of giving peer-to-peer -peer support, I usually won't share any type of advice or even provide feedback unless I've already asked, are you open to feedback? Because nine times out of 10, if they're not asking for it, they're not gonna receive what you have to offer anyways. So wanting to, you know, for me anyways, wanting to try to contain myself from trying to overtly give advice, we need to let the other person choose um, and self self discern, you know, what works for them and, and where they go and offer choices and all of that. Do you agree? 
Absolutely. And I think it can really, it can be kind of dangerous to give advice, especially when um, acting in the peer role, right? So, you know, you, you touch on it, like our lane as peers is not to diagnose people. It's not to give clinical advice, any of those things. And so I think it could be dangerous and a disservice to that person that we're supporting. Um, but I think, you know, there are certainly tools in the peer toolbox that we can use, right? Like open-ended questions, uh, the miracle question, motivational interviewing, to where you can help that person kind of guide and find their own solution to whatever it is they're posing. And then I think, of course, you hit it too, um, asking if they're open to feedback. But if they're not asking for your advice, maybe they just really want to be heard. Because sometimes that's healing too, is just getting things out and having somebody listen and refrain from giving advice, right? Sometimes people just need that. So I think, yes, it's it's it can be a balancing act. And I think sometimes, especially when we're new to the role in the profession, like we innately want to give our advice, but just knowing to, okay, you got to refrain, reel it in and let that person make that decision. Or if you feel like I need to impart this wisdom on that person, ask them, are you open to a little bit of feedback or just kind of what, what I'm hearing you say um, something and approach it that way. So, so before, before we start to wrap up here, I want you, Heather, to be thinking about any closing thoughts or any closing ideas that you would want the listeners to, to leave with um, in terms of self-empowerment, in terms of um, allowing themselves uh, the knowledge and resources um, to do their job well in, in a way that respects the other person for where they're at and the pathways that they choose, even if it's not your pathway. And so one one thought and idea I have, well, and I'll give you a second to think about how to respond, what you want the listeners to leave with, Heather, I was thinking about the empowerment of the supervision, um, of, of, you know, utilizing and leveraging supervision time um, to get feedback, to bounce things off of. Look, you know, I met with a client, I shared this, this was their response. I'm not sure if that was appropriate. I'm not sure if maybe I shouldn't have shared, maybe I overshared, like, and just like really digging in to the supervision piece is something that I, I wish I had done and uh, and known how valuable it was sooner um, because I could have, I probably could have saved some hard conversations. Um, but is there anything um, in closing, Heather, that you would like the listeners to, to remember about our time together today? Yeah, I think, well, one, I just wanna commend everyone for entering into the profession of being a certified peer professional. I think it's, you know, a, a lot of the reasons why we get into the space is we want to help others and hopefully dissuade people from making some of the same mistakes we maybe made um, in our previous slides. And so I just wanna thank everybody for taking a leap into this profession because we certainly always need more certified peers. Um, and then, really leaning into knowing that there are a lot of organizations throughout the country and even in Indiana, like statewide organizations of peers supporting peers. And so know that there is always resource and uh, support for you out there to connect with other peers. And certainly your supervisors should be like first and foremost who you go to, but know that there's always online meetings and support systems available as you're kind of moving forward in your professional growth to bounce ideas off, get some feedback from. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, and so utilize those to your advantage. So powerful, Heather, thank you so much. Heather, it was great talking with you and thank you so much for sharing your lived experience uh, with us today. So for anyone watching this video, I hope this helps you find support for yourself as a peer specialist and or understand how we can best support peers and their important work. If you need more resources around peer support, please visit smiadvisor.org. You can also find free education, hundreds of free resources, and a consultation service that lets you submit questions and get answers from national experts. Thank you so much for joining us today.